Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. Today's episode is with NYU professor and science journalist Charles Seif. We're here to talk about fusion energy and the big announcement at the Department of Energy last month that said there was a major breakthrough towards a potential future of near limitless energy. So now that it's been a month, we're going to look at the hype. We're going to look at the science, how fusion energy works, how it's different than traditional fission-based nuclear power, all those great things. I know this is going to be up people's alleys because we've done a lot of coverage of energy and nuclear of late. Hope you all enjoy this episode and definitely check back in the comments if you want anything you want to add. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Charles Seif, welcome to The Realignment. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad to speak with you about this topic. Let's just start with the very basic definitions section. What is fusion energy? So people are more familiar with fission energy, where you take very heavy atoms like uranium and plutonium and split them apart. And when you do something like that, a little bit of mass goes missing and is converted to energy. Uh, you've heard of equals mc squared. That means energy can be converted into matter and vice versa. So a tiny little bit of mass going missing with these uh, fission uh, reactions uh, causes a huge amount of energy to be released. And we've been doing that since uh, 1942. Fusion, on the other hand, um, is the reverse problem. Very, very light atom, uh, like hydrogen. If you smash them together and force them to stick, that releases energy as well. Um, and since, again, the 40s, scientists have realized that you could harness this to release energy. Uh, in fact, the sun is doing that right now, that in the center of the sun, you've got hydrogen, which is the most abundant element, uh, being smashed together under huge pressure and temperatures uh, and releasing energy. And that's what makes the sun shine. Um, doing this on Earth is a lot harder. Uh, we actually succeeded in the 1950s by using an atom bomb, which was powered by uh, fission. We were able to harness that energy and create a small amount of uh, hydrogen to um, uh, collapse, fuse, and, uh, sorry, I'm going to just shut the clock. No problem. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, so a, uh, you take a small amount of uh, hydrogen and cause it to fuse. And so uh, we can do that. That's the center of the hydrogen bomb. So you can wipe out an island, kind of wipe out a city with this energy. However, doing it in a laboratory where you want a small amount that doesn't wipe out your entire uh, city is really, really difficult. So since uh, the late 40s, early 50s, this is what scientists have been trying to do, to do it on a small scale, um, using atoms together and releasing that energy in a way that can be controlled. And we have not been able to do that so far. When you're referencing 1942 with fission, obviously this you know brings to mind nuclear weapons, bombs, Cold War, all the things that are by definition dangerous. To what degree is the fusion process tied to danger, risk, et cetera? Well, um, both are tied to atomic weapons, as you mentioned. So there's that level of danger that the so far, our only real useful uh, output of fusion energy is destruction. Uh, however, um, fission, as you know, has been used in power plant. We have successfully taken hunks of uranium, put them together um, in a controlled manner, very kind of carefully tweaking that reaction so that it just produces a little more energy uh, that we put in and we harness that. So, uh, fission plants have been operating since the fifties and, uh, they're very useful. The problem is that they produce radioactive waste as these large atoms break apart. They leave other radioactive atoms, which is kind of hard to get rid of. Uh, there's other problems as well. Um, you can take some of that material and leak into the environment. It irradiates stuff. Uh, as we know, if you have something catastrophic, you can have what's called a meltdown, uh, where 
that uh, fishing reaction gets out of control, that very careful balance that we have to prevent it from running amok uh, gets out of control and uh, you can actually get an out of control reaction. With fusion, that, those elements are less of a worry. You can't really have a meltdown because uh, to get fusion going, you have to maintain everything under very high pressure, very high temperature. And that's when you get the fusion going. Um, if the reaction goes out of control, it blow itself apart. So you get essentially uh, a big puff uh, once you kind of escape the pressure confinement. Um, Can you clarify puff? Is yeah. puff as benign as the word puff suggests, or is there something deeper than that? Well, there's something deeper than that. The, there are things called, for example, plasma disruption. So some of the bottles which have a magnetic field around them um, will lose control and the magnetic fields will whip around and the entire reactor will jump up an inch. I mean, so you've got a, a, a 40 ton instrument going pop, uh, but it is not like a nuclear bomb because the materials aren't there. It's not a, uh, a real large amount of material under a huge pressure. It's kind of, again, it's closer to equilibrium. So it's harder to kind of, uh, go, haywire out control in a way that's large. Um, the other element is that the nuclear waste, um, a lot of the fusion, uh, advocates say that it's totally clean. This isn't true. Um, that's when you produce fusion under most, uh, ways people are talking about producing fusion and produce what are called neutron, which are particles, uh, that make up the atom and they irradiate everything. I make things that aren't uh, radioactive, radioactive, just by their presence. So when you have a fusion reactor running, the entire reactor slowly becomes radioactive. And now this stuff isn't as nasty as the heavy elements in uh, fission, but it is still something you have to deal with, and it's a large volume of it, so you have to dispose of it. Um, there's also another element that is of danger with fusion as well, is that it means when I, when I say hydrogen, um, I'm talking actually about what are called isotopes of hydrogen. So hydrogen comes in multiple flavors, with, which depends on how many neutrons the atom has. So you have hydrogen, which is the lightest version, then deuterium, which is the next heaviest version, and then the tritium, which is heavier still. So um, tritium is really the crucial and hard to get stuff, which powers both the fusion reaction that we are going to be doing in the near term. And that is radioactive and it's kind of nasty stuff. And it's not easy to get a large amount of, uh, the good news is that once you have neutrons, like you have in a fusion reaction, you can create tritium. Uh, the bad news is that once you're creating tritium on large scales, it itself becomes a hazard. So, um, Tritium, which is created through neutron activation of lithium or other materials, uh, you probably will have a blanket around the fusion reactor containing those materials that create tritium. One could imagine if there were a breach in the reactor or a fire or something like that, all that tritium would get out into the environment. So that is an environmental worry as well. So uh, that's a long answer to your question, but uh, the environmental and safety concerns are not as acute as they are in fission power plants, but they still exist and they are slightly different. Another question that comes to mind from this then is what's just here about the most good faith articulation of like the promise uh, of fusion? Like what would a world power by fusion look like? And what problems would that effectively, quote unquote, and this is kind of the point of, I think, your work, using the word solve kind of misses the point, but like for the sake of this conversation, what would be solved by a fusion-powered world? Yeah, so the main advantage of fusion, like fission, is that you are creating energy on demand um, based upon materials you've gathered. You're basically burning materials, but these materials 
don't contribute to climate change. These are not uh, carbon producing uh, fuels. So in theory, if you were able to produce fusion energy on a large scale and cheaply, it would be able to replace coal burning and gas burning and oil burning power plants. And so uh, one could imagine if we had this magic solution in 20 years, all of a sudden you have this cheap uh, fusion energy source, um, it would significantly reduce um, the car- our carbon footprint as a society. However, uh, that's kind of in the best case scenario, and I think that ignores a lot of practicalities, including uh, not just the difficulty of making these plants, but the cost of making these plants and the cost of putting the energy on the grid in a way that competes with existing very cheap uh, methods of producing energy. I mean, if you can produce enough energy to satisfy you by throwing a rock in a fire, you have to have a good justification for having a multi-billion dollar, highly technical, very difficult to build uh, operation to replace it. I think you just hit at a couple of different things, things I want to discuss. So A, as you no doubt know, the cliche about the failed promise of nuclear energy is that in the 50s, it was supposed to be too cheap to meter. This was the promise of nuclear energy. And this has, frankly, nothing to do with, let's say, like the climate change concern, which becomes much more of a, let's say, selling point of nuclear energy, like moving into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and to today. So back in the 50s, you're not talking about climate change. You're talking about industrialization, you need energy. There's all this promise from nuclear fission, obviously. So to what degree are the ideal scenarios of fusion inherently cheap? Or is that a problem to be solved, right? So what I'm kind of getting at is, is nuclear, sorry, is is is, is fusion cheap inherently? Or is that something we're kind of saying, assume we solve the cheapness problem, assume we solve this, 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 and that, wow, there's a glorious future in front of us. Yeah, no, I'm afraid it's not inherently cheap any more than fission is inherently cheap. On paper, I mean, it's a great technological solution. It's, it's, it's kind of in the abstract. You just bash these atoms together, boom, energy comes out. Uh, as you point out, in the 50s, there was this equal optimism about fission that all you have to do is stuff enough uranium in a uh, close enough space, throw some rods in, and boom, energy, too cheap to meter. In fact, that that phrase came from Louis Strauss, who was the um, head of the AEC in the 50s. So, um, yeah, the problem is, I mean, if you look, fission is a really good guy. It's technologically simpler in many ways. Again, all you have to do is take enough of this fairly abundant material put it together in a clever way, throw some control rods in, and you've got something which will boil water. Um, it is obviously more difficult to do that in a safe way, in a way that uh, disposes of waste properly, but it is doable. I mean, this is something that our society has figured out. But on balance, we choose not to embrace that solution right now because as uh, technologically appealing as it is, it has both political and social consequences that we don't want to live with right now. Uh, we, when you uh, process uranium, you you have uh, the problem of nuclear waste, and we have to figure out where to put it. And our national solution at Yucca Mountain fell through. We currently don't have a plan for storing this waste. So the nuclear plant operators are running and they're storing their waste on site generally, and it's a, a something that has been deferred. So it's it's been punted to a future society to figure out. Um, but that aside, if, even if we had a uh, waste solution, if you look at the price of building a nuclear power plant just to make it safe and reasonable and have all the safeguards and keep all the regulation all the regulatory agencies happy, it is expensive. Uh, On a per kilowatt hour price, uh, it is several times more expensive than uh, gas or uh, coal or even other renewables. Um, So, yeah, it is a part of our energy portfolio, but it is not 
dominant and it is not solving the problem. Uh, I think fusion in the best case scenario is going to be, have that sort of contour. It is going to be a solution of sorts. It's going to have its advantages and disadvantages, at least in the short and near term, it's going to be expensive. Um, so I think that its adoption will depend very much upon how much we need it, how much we're willing to pay to forego the cheaper stuff that is already available and out there. You know, more questions come from that. So A, what does short, medium, and long-term even mean in this context? Because, you know, you did an interview with CBS, you know, and you said, quote, I have a running bet that this will not be commercially available until 2050. So if we're talking, you know, almost 30 years, what do the terms even medium and long-term even mean? Because from a climate change perspective, from a, wow, we're too dependent on Russian natural gas perspective, 30 years isn't particularly useful. So how do you think about the timelines? Yeah, I think I think that's part of the problem. I have to say, I made that bet uh, more than 15 years ago. So we've already lost a generation of time uh, between the bet and uh, now. So yeah, climate change is urgent. So I think a near-term solutions, we should be looking in decade, two decades of major change. And I don't think fusion uh, winds up on that list just because it's not possible. So things like uh, major engineering of nuclear power plants or renewables, even more radical questions like geoengineering, I think might have to be on the table to ameliorate some of the problems that we're going to see in the next couple of decades. So I think short term is <laughs> within the next 20 to 30 years. And I think fusion is just off the table. Uh, midterm, we can say 30 to 60, 30 to 100. Uh, maybe fusion can contribute there, uh, but I think it's an unproven uh, prospect right now. Again, we are, we are still far away from getting something that is commercializable, much less even a proven principle. Um, I would say it is possible that fusion will play a role in the midterm. Um, but I honestly would bet against, uh, it's playing a significant role in the next 50 years. Uh, and then long-term, I mean, if society is still around in a uh, hundred years, 200 years, 500 years, I would say probably fusion will play a role. I mean, it's, it is something that our society will need as our energy, in, uh, energy demands increase. Um, there's a, uh, cost to renewables uh, on some level, uh, that there are material questions that come into many of the photovoltaics and other, uh, renewables that we haven't really addressed. Um, so I would not at all be surprised if, if we're around the year 2250 or 2500, that power is largely, uh, produced by fusion. That's quite possible. But I think right now our crisis is, uh, getting through the next uh, 50 years, uh, without serious damage to the environment. And, I mean, we we're, we're already seeing, uh, effects of climate change now. And I think, uh, hoping for this deus ex machina to come down and save us, uh, is ignoring the nearer term problems that we have to make hard decisions to solve. Yeah, I want to move ahead a little in the script because you just referenced, uh, you know, Deus Ex Machina. You know, the the book you wrote back in 2008, 2009 is The Sun in a Bottle, The Strange History of Fusion, and The Science of Wishful Thinking. The Deus Ex Machina reference kind of speaks to the wishful thinking aspect here. So can you just speak about like that second part of the title and how you see fusion playing a role given the problem sets we just kind of described during this episode? Yeah, this is this is where I mean, something a solution on paper is so technologically beautiful that in the abstract it looks so lovely that you just are attracted to it. You can't say no. And fusion is one of those things. And for for multiple generations, scientists have been thinking this is it. This is how we're going to solve our energy problem uh, because again, on paper, the most abundant element in the universe producing energy, producing no real waste, and uh, 
it's it's just there for us uh, for the picking. It's like it's like uh, the the uh, fruit hanging down there that we think just out of our grasp. But again, unfortunately, and this is this is the history of fusion is that every time we come close, that apple seems to be further out of our grasp. But there's complications and there's uh, scientific complications and, and scientific complications can often be overcome and we've been overcoming them for generation after generation, but they're real big and they're real severe and we are still overcoming. Uh, but on the second level, I mean, this, this, this hope is techno fix for, I mean, I think I should, problems are societal. I mean, it, that more than technological in that, uh, imagine that we had this great solution come down to us from the aliens, I uh, uh, think, uh, to, to serve mad before we get, eaten. we've got these wonderful power plants. Um, even if we were starting to produce the, the cost and the difficulty of the, the way those plants would fit into a society where we're based upon scarcity and, uh, uh, in, in for, for determining value and, uh, kind of that all the labor that goes into it forces kind of scarcity. So, I mean, it has to fit into our economic model. So even with this perfect solution, it's unclear how the economics would work. And again, with, with things that are high tech, high labor, high research, they tend to be expensive. So it's, again, uh, we have come up with ways to land on the moon. Um, it's technologically feasible. It is within our hand. But we do not have moon cities because they are just not economically and societally practical. Um, maybe we will find a way to use that space someday and maybe there will be a need. But until then, I am not selling uh, shares in moon proper. And I think fusion is very similar to moon property right now. It's, we don't have um, a cost-effective way of exploiting that resource that we need. You know, that brings to mind another question since you're referencing the moon. Obviously, given the dynamics you're describing, aka it seems like we have a huge series of intractable problems combining with, you know, economic costs and scale, political gridlock. So this idea of these moonshots, especially because we're trying to bring in models and rhetoric from like that early World War II at a Cold War period where it seems like we were making scientific progress, moonshots have become fashionable of late. What do you think about the concept of just setting that overambitious, seemingly impossible goal? So I could see a critic of you on this podcast saying, okay, Charles, that's all well and good. But if we were to sit here in 1959 and say, America's going to be in the moon 10 years from now, this, 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 and that, that's impossible. How do you think about this framework of impossibility versus ambition and the trade-offs in the balancing act there? Well, I think I think I think you raise a very good point. I mean, uh, before the moonshot, no one thought it could be done, and it was decades and decades away, and we we happened to do it. Um, I think the difference here is that this is not an ambition-driven um, story; it's a kind of a humanity survival driven story that uh if we had failed at the moonshot and the russians did fail at the moonshot and they killed a bunch of people doing it, um there wasn't much lost besides ego right now again i think the stakes are very very high that we need something to mitigate climate change and i think by putting all our hopes on this one basket of things is a very foolish way of uh, dealing with our crisis. And I think I, I, I would absolutely agree. That, I mean, if this were the abstract, and uh, I, I think money going fusion, research fusion energy, as skeptical as I am, I think that is a good thing. I mm -hmm. think it does help kind of explore a potential option. However, given the nature of the crisis that we're seeing right now is that the wisest way to mitigate our problems now. And I would say that as part of a broader portfolio, uh, yes, put more energy into fusion uh, research. However, there's lots of things that aren't 
important technologically within reach and just aren't as sexy to -hmm. scientists. Um, Things like batteries and uh, energy storage and energy storage on a large scale, uh, improving the efficiency of our transmission and uh, uh, improving our grid system, Um, looking at other kind of efficiencies of geothermal and wind and other renewables, uh, uh, solar thermal, uh, all sorts of things like that, which I think belong in a portfolio and are being ignored because this stuff is sexy. This is the stuff that the venture capitalists, this is the stuff that the Silicon Valley techno bros like, because again, on paper, it's so beautiful. Let's do it. Let's do this moonshot. When I think it's I think there's a lot of other things that need to be done uh, first. A question that comes to mind then is that Biden moonshot timeline uh, we discussed earlier, their official timeline is like, you know, 10 years to a commercial reactor. Obviously, you're not just skeptical. You're just making the claim that that's not going to happen. There's very little euphemism there. Could you just give us a articulation of what that would even look like given given? So let's, let's just assume something is happening, right? So once again, and this is probably why the moonshot, the literal moonshot is different than this. In the case of, you know, the moonshot, you could say, okay, in 1960, we're going to orbit the earth. In 1961, we're going to do this. And then you could just have a specific timeline of metrics and spaces you need to hit. The Soviets don't make it all the way down that timeline, but there's still a timeline. What would need to happen economically, technically, politically, investment-wise for that moonshot timeline to be hit? Okay. So stage one is break even. And break even in any normal sense is getting more energy out than you put in to a reaction. And this very big announcement that was in December by Livermore, um, the National Admission Facility, had what they call break even. It was a break even of sorts, it's a definition that scientists agreed upon, uh, that more li- energy comes out of a fusion reaction that is put in by lasers. This is kind of a laser fusion project where you've got a little pellet of hydrogen and lasers essentially shine to produce X-rays that compress that pellet. And for the two megajoules of laser energy that went into the reaction, uh, three megajoules, 3.15 megajoules came out. So there is more energy out than put in. So that is a form of break even. That is kind of the and, first and what's, little step. With and what's a megajoule? Like, what's a, how should we conceptualize a megajoule? I like to think of it as about the amount of energy that a piece of kindling gives you. So if you throw a piece of kindling on the fire, that's roughly a megajoule. So uh, a watt is one joule per second. So a hundred watt bulb burns a hundred joules per second. So you could think of this as enough energy to have uh, 10,000 hundred watt bulbs for one second. I, th- I think the kindling analogy is a little easier for us to grasp. Um, so uh, the problem here is that to get those three megajoules out, we actually had to pour about 300 megajoules into the laser to generate that two megajoule B. So even if you give them kind of this little kind of this two, uh, three megajoules out to two megajoules again, that isn't really a true break even. Uh, it's, it's, it's a scientific break even and not an engineering break even. So stage one is getting engineering break even. And you can see even this huge breakthrough is a factor of a hundred away. Um, I think that honestly, the laser, uh, certainly NIF's laser version is a dead end, uh, for fusion energy. I think the magnetic versions, which use a magnetic bottle, usually in the shape of a donut are more likely that you can say we are 70% of the way there almost. Uh, so I, I think, I think we're, we're closer in that area. Um, okay, but let's say stage one, one of these plants produces more energy than you get out, uh, that, that you put in. And that includes 
not just kind of producing it, but collecting it, converting it in an efficient manner, more energy out than that. Okay. That's stage one. And I don't think, honestly, I think we're at least 20 years away from something that can demonstrate that. The second stage is figuring out how to make that commercially viable, uh, create a power plant design uh, from that demonstration power plant. So say 20 years from now, we have that power plant um, demonstration working. And I will say that 20 years is optimistic. Even if you look at kind of the fusion projects, timelines for demonstration power plants, Big Eater and things like that are are not talking about demonstration power plants until 2050. Um, but say we get one, you have to design it. You have to figure out how to um, get uh, a, a design that the regulators will allow in a... Uh, hopefully a kind of a weak reducible sense and do that uh, reliably. So let's say we have a design like um, the GE nuclear power plant design. That'll take another decade to turn from a demonstration plant to a commercial design. And then from design, you have to build. And that's assuming the cost is low enough that it makes sense to build. But, okay, so let's start building six, seven years per plant. And then the first fusion energy plants would come on the grid. Uh, we're now talking 20 years to demonstration, another 10 years to design a plant, another decade to build the first plant. We're talking two to three generations out before we see fusion energy on the grid. So it's all possible. It would be great if it could happen. Um, but I, again, I don't think it's realistic in the short to near term. Um, midterm maybe, but again, uh, why is this sucking up so much of our attention and energy when it is simply not going to help us now? Actually, help us understand the attention in energy aspect of this so basically like to what degree to what degree is like the the research the development the news cycle time like a zero sum game yeah that's 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 a political well, it's a, it used to be entirely a political question because almost all fusion energy research was in the governmental sector this has changed recently with a tremendous amount of venture capital flowing into commercial fusion uh, ventures. So uh, um, starting with the kind of the, the political question, uh, yeah, I do think it was more or less a zero sum game in that um, the budget for science is finite. The, the budget for pure science is even more finite. Um, that science Governmental science advanced since World War II based upon this kind of uh, agreement that scientists had with the government, uh, the Department of Energy in particular, that we are a, a physicists are a really important resource for you come wartime. Well, we can build nuclear weapons. We can uh, do your creepy toys that you need. Um, However, you have to fund basic research. And so since the, the, the 1950s, uh, there's kind of this, this quid pro quo where, science, where the government would fund these uh, energy labs and uh, give these accelerators and particle uh, things at like Fermilab, which didn't have an immediate practical use uh, because Politicians were convinced that it was a good thing for society. And it was usually through kind of the weapons and was 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 the most persuasive to politicians. Um, since the Cold War, um, that agreement has kind of been failing. And shortly after the Berlin Wall fell, you started seeing um, cutbacks in pure science in a way that there weren't before. The superconducting super collider went down. 
uh, the International Space Station, which one could argue whether that's science or not, was in trouble. Um, and I think you started seeing a very careful kind of measure of what should be uh, uh, funded and what shouldn't. So I, I think that there's more of a zero uh, sum game in science, even in politics, since the 1989 or so. Um, that being said, there's infinite, I mean, there's, there's lots of venture capital that can do whatever it wants. And so because fusion has caught the attention of venture capitalists, fusion is getting funded. Um, who knows what kind of catches these people's fancy. I, I, I'm not sure this is a, a zero sum game as much as it is a marketing game. Uh, what is hot? What is hot now? Uh, and I think uh, you get trends, and right now Fusion is uh, riding a trend way, and more power to it. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want. I mean, I'm glad that this venture capital stuff is going into uh, uh, Fusion Energy rather than uh, sports watches, say, or whatever. It's 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 a on balance. I think it's a good thing, but I, as with other venture capital, there's no no. No guarantee that it's linked to any external economic reality or, for that matter, need. A question that comes to mind then is a couple of things in these last 10 minutes. So number one, it seems like, especially in reference to your Atlantic piece that we'll link in the show notes, that folks were really looking for a Kitty Hawk moment. Obviously, a Kitty Hawk moment relating to you know the first um, flight, of course. So... What is and you kind of answered this already, basically pointing out like break e break even. That is the that is the Kitty Hawk moment. So I'd love for you just to talk about the importance of symbols. Then this is more symbolic. This is energy. This makes me reach out to you to do the podcast. Like, how do symbols work in the scientific space? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, I, I would argue that again, this this big big breakthrough. And again, I don't want to diminish the fact that this is a real scientific achievement. This is something that scientists have been trying to do for decades and it failed and they finally got it done. So first time in six decades that this has been able to have been achieved. First, uh, well, the, the first time since the definition of uh, break even that I would say goes back to at least uh, late 90s. Okay. So, but yes, uh, this this is the first, the first, and it's just the first defensible uh, argument that you've got control fusion uh, break even in the lab. Um, so it is not a practical step towards energy for reasons we've already talked about. Uh, also the fact that this, this laser is has to repeat 10,000 times. If again, you've got a piece of kindling, you've got to burn kindling continuously and the NIF lasers can fire twice, three times a day at most because the laser has to cool down. Mm -hmm. So this, I don't think this is a concrete step forward towards fusion energy. However, this is a symbol that we have been achieved an external landmark, an external milestone that we are actually moving forward rather than spinning our wheels. And I would say that to a large extent, uh, uh, we have spent a lot of time spinning our wheels for very little forward motion. Uh, and the joke that fusion is 20 years away and always will be is, is, is a product of that because every time we think we kind of trying to make an assessment of how difficult the problem is and how much work has to go in, yeah, it seems like, okay, two decades, a generation seems reasonable. And yet we spin our wheels. Um, Either the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is underway in uh, uh, Catarache in, in, in France, the estimate was that it was going to have first lights and it was 10 years back in 2004. Uh, currently, uh, the current timeline has first light in 2025, five years. So over the past 20 years, uh, 10 years, uh, 
the 10 years has shrunk to five. So there's this weird time dilation that's going on that 20 years turns out to be five. And in fact, the eater schedule is about to slip probably by another five years. So 20 years have basically done nothing in terms of uh, our temporal view of how close we're getting. So there's a lot of wheels. These symbols, these external symbols are really important to give milestones and kind of give the sense that there is stuff that we're learning despite all the difficulties that we're having and all the inflated claims. Uh, and uh, a lot of these companies, which are touted as startups that have been around for decades, uh, I don't know of anything else that could be called a startup that's 20 years old and has made promises of use of energy by 2014 and has failed. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 these symbols are nice because they are a way of grounding, um, research with reality that they are step, uh, that we could say, this is, this is something that we couldn't do before and we can do now. And with fusion, unfortunately, those milestones, those external, real, verifiable milestones are very few and far between. So for these last three questions, number one, I'd love for you just to hear or tell us what writing about studying fusion has taught you about, or maybe giving you when it comes to like a theory of how technological progress happens. So for example, go back to Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks and he's sketching out like a rudimentary flying machine. 500 years later, roughly speaking, Kitty Hawk. Then we have, you know, in 10 years, you have biplanes dueling over Europe and then the atomic bomb on and on and on and on and on, right? So that's how that period compresses. How does thinking about maybe flight, for example, imagination to practicality inform how you think about progress, especially in this case too? Yeah, no, that flight is a really good analogy um, for what's going on in fusion technology generally. Um, so I think the first lesson is that they, the uh, technological process is very nonlinear. <laughs> it moves in fits and starts, and then also our imagination outruns uh, practicality by quite a distance. So mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci came up with essentially a rudimentary uh, airplane, a rudimentary helicopter. Uh, these things that he came up with were not practical at the time for a number of reasons. In fact, if you think about the airplane, it really wasn't until you had the internal combustion engine and one powerful enough to drag an airfoil through space fast enough um, that you really were able to get that Kitty Hawk moment. Um, so the what made something practical came from an unexpected direction. And once you had the internal combustion engine and you had a uh, a practical reason for them. So between uh, 1900 and 1914, you had this development of the plane, which was fairly remarkable. If you look at between 1914 uh, and 1918, the development went much, much, much faster. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's it's because of the engine, but, but also because of the practical use. It was all of a sudden something that was necessary, uh, and uh, there was, there was that fluorescence of innovation. That's what kind of made, you know, even until kind of world war one, you, you, you didn't have a commercial passenger liner possible, uh, at that time, but by 1930s, by 1920s, you, you started getting, um, engines powerful enough to, to drag eight bolt through the air at once and largely bomb things like that. So, um, yeah, I think I think a combination of uh, unexpected technological advances that kind of break down one of the unexpected barriers, plus the practical need for it combined, kind of make that uh, environment grow. And if you think about it, also, I mean, um, how has uh, air how how have aerodynamics how how has the airline industry progressed since 1960? Once that kind of longing need diminishes, the pace of innovation goes. Um, what are the big innovations? You can say uh, supersonics 
uh, which were important. I mean, but not not on a commercial mm. sector. Uh, they're kind of a dead end at this point. And stealth. I mean, it's. I mean, it, it compared to the the efflorescence back then. Kind of our modern technology hasn't made much of a difference. The B fifty two is still kind of an optimal element in our space of airplane, and that is. Uh, I mean, they're so old that uh, uh, they're they're getting to be as old as the oldest human beings on Earth, um, and are going to be used to the 2040s. You know, I mean, it's the, I mean, they're upgraded. It's but it's the the general airframe and the configuration, the theoretical concept has been will be used for almost a century, and that's that's the interesting point. <laughs> that's exactly it. So I mean, that that we optimize for our societal needs, and what once you get there, you don't necessarily push beyond it. Um, and I'll point out that also, I mean, you don't, there are other ways of getting flight besides fixed wing. Uh, mm -hmm. Before Kitty Hawk, there were the Montgolfier brothers and the hot air balloons. And we also had Zeppelin. And all of these things had limited practicality, but could solve a problem. And to the extent that they would solve a problem, they were exploited, like observation balloons, warfare. Um, and so I think that you have, you can't think of a technology without understanding its limitations and the niche within which it will function. Mm -hmm. And I think without kind of a real understanding, like say, okay, hot air balloons are great. You know, get you up high, but from going from place to place, they're not very useful. So for this niche, it's very good and we will develop it for this. And, but for something else, we need another solution. I think that's true in energy as well. So this next question is a pure curiosity question. So I obviously have my copy of Sun in a Bottle here, Strange History of Fusion and, and the Science of Wishful Thinking. Book came out in 2008. Um, it's not very common that I can book a guest who wrote a book you know, uh, in previous decades, yet still, I think, quite relevant. So for folks who are interested in like purchasing the book and checking it out, what would you say if you were to do kind of like the updated and revised edition, like what, aside from just the hook of this story, which we've discussed, what does 2009 to 2021 look like? It's surprising how little has changed fundamentally about the book. The book, the book is really stone dead on uh, for everything. Um, the one real change is the creation of the commercial sector, um, uh, the modern commercial sector. And that is a fairly recent thing. Um, when I was writing the book, there were maybe one or two, uh, weirdo companies out there trying to do fusion on their own. Now there is a score of them and there's billions of dollars. In fact, I think we're at the point where um, private capital is outspending, uh, public funding or we're, we're close, uh, now. Um, so I would probably put another chapter in to talk about the commercial sector. And there's this interesting history there too, actually, that laser fusion actually started off in the commercial sector. There was a dramatic scene. I, I, only, I skimmed over in, in the book mm. because it was, it was, not as centrally relevant, but there was a, uh, a laser fusion aficionado who was making these claims of near break even with laser. And they, he was testifying in front of Congress and had a heart attack while testifying and died that day. So there's this kind of, uh, drama there. And so the idea that, uh, Silicon Valley step in and solve these problems that the government had been inefficiently grappling with by, uh, for the past three generations is another theme. And I think it's also, I mean, it fits in very well because it's a, it's a, it's a form of technological arrogance that we have seen a lot coming from Silicon Valley. Um, that is part and parcel with the technological scientific arrogance of our society as whole thinking we can, we can just think through these problems and this is the way forward. Let's just do it. If, if we use our mind, uh, we smart lab coats can solve it. And sometimes it isn't that easy. And for the last question here, I'm like really proud of the fact that our, our audience is very 
um, let's say solutions um, oriented and pragmatically focused. And we kind of hinted at, hinted at this like during um, the earlier part of the episode, but I really want to just drag this out so it could be specifically stated. So if you are bearish on the prospects of Fusion's ability to, let's say, solve or address the problems of climate change, to reduce reliance on like petrochemical um, energy that for reasons not even related to climate change, let's say like Putin, Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, we'd want to move on from. What is your recommendation then? Kind of reiterating what you said earlier, so we can just clip it specifically for what we should do if you've identified these sets of problems and you were excited maybe coming to the episode about fusion being the answer to those problems. Yeah, I, I would really advocate a portfolio approach. And I think that we need from the Department of Energy a kind of a uh, more coherent set of goals and demands, not just across, I mean, generation of energy, which fusion comes into, but again, grid, uh, 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 kind of, uh, revising the grid, making more efficient energy storage, uh, energy storage, really kind of looking at the whole picture and say, what things can we hammer on now to get the best bang for our buck? And it may not be in the generation sector at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may not be that even more solar power plants would be a good idea. It may be that if we spend our money on uh, uh, superconducting transmission grids, that would be better. Um, so I think looking at the picture holistically is really the important thing. And I think holistically also includes, I, I, I mean, this, this prospect scares me to death, um, geoengineering and other kind of more radical mitigation, uh, climate mitigation uh, techniques, that it may be we could buy a century by putting reflective particles in our upper atmosphere, um, in which case we should probably do that. But of course, the, the unknowns are huge. Um, I, think, I think those sorts of solutions need to be studied as well as kind of all our energy production, transmission, storage, issues um man i said i said last question but you, you just kind of provoked me there earlier when you were critiquing uh our, our tech bro friends you you were, you were describing like scientific arrogance if we were to describe something as arrogant one could argue that particles in the atmosphere would qualify as arrogance so what are what is your what is, and once again like arrogance is inherent to any human endeavor so it's not like that's you know, kind of comes with the comes with uh, what you're working with here. But what's your guide for arrogance? As yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, geoengineering. I mean, this is why it scares me to death because there's <laughs> about even what the the archetype of arrogance. Uh, <laughs> I think I think though that there are ways of doing control tests that don't uh, uh, are are not irreversible and uh, little. Kind of steps along the way. I think I think the arrogance comes in and saying, "I can do this. I think that uh, if I if I see it in the sky, we'd solve uh, global warming." I think there's a difference with coming with a little bit of humility and saying, "Look, this is <laughs> this is a, a somewhat crazy idea, and it can go really wrong, but maybe this is something we should look at uh, given the severity of what we have." Um, again, we're, we're, we're if thinking as a patient, um, when you are healthy, uh, you're less likely to risk things and take, uh, 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 a radical, uh, an untested pill, mm -hmm. uh, when you are terminal, mm -hmm. you're much more willing to, uh, do kind of crazy things. And I think uh, sadly, as a kind of a patient, we are moving towards uh, uh, a greater ailment that have to take more risks, which indeed uh, causes more, kind of puts us in the hands of higher arrogance. I mean, if, if you asked me 40 years ago, I'd say it's way premature to start thinking about geoengineering. We should, we should do much more calm things first. But, um, I mean, we're already seeing uh, kind of uh, warnings about species die off in the seas and the bed due to warming 
temperatures and all of that. So we have to, uh, actually, that's another thing we should really work on is kind of understand the timeline and figure out what risks, how much risk we need to bear now to mitigate in what time period. Because, I mean, we, we, could, we could do it slow and steady and make things all better by 2,500. That the, the suffering that that would cause uh, and the environmental damage that that would cause just makes it impractical. When do we really have to fish or cut bait? It's probably the right way to think about it. Charles, this has been really fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything, um, could you just do a quick uh, shout out to your recent book on Stephen Hawking? I was telling you before the recording, I really um, enjoyed that while doing my background research, but I think that's the most recent work of yours that folks should check out if they enjoyed this conversation. Well, thank you. Yeah, that I mean, actually, I think this this last book was the best book I've ever written. It's it's a biography of Stephen Hawking, and it's called Hawking Hawking uh, because it's partially about the selling of Stephen Hawking as the world's biggest genius. And uh, well, Stephen Hawking was really a uh, a fascinating character and a brilliant scientist. Um, it's interesting to see how he was marketed, packaged, and made into the world's smartest man. And it tells us a lot about our perception of science, our perception of scientists, and our perception of disability um, to see kind of that sausage being made. So it's, it's, it's a biography of Stephen Hawking, but it's also a kind of a jaundiced look at uh, the way we look at science, the way we look at celebrity. Is the spoiler that Stephen Hawking was not actually the world's greatest genius? Is that the uh, implication folks should take? Well, yes, he, he was definitely in the top rank of scientists, but if you had to pick an archetypal successor to Einstein, uh, there are, I mean, within the scientific community itself, he was not in your top 10 list, actually. Wow. Okay. So that's the that's the uh, the spoiler, but also I think the enticement for folks. I've got the book on Audible. It's really enjoyable. Uh, Charles, thank you for joining me on the realignment. Thank you very very much for having. Me. 